So in the previous video, we talked about um, characteristics of, well, I guess the first video, we talked about characteristics of animals and how they are classified or divided into groups. And in the one after that, we started talking about the first few phyla of invertebrates. So we talked about phylum periphera, which included the poor bearing sponges. We talked about phylum cnidaria, which included the jellyfish and sea anemone. Um, we talked about the three groups of worms, so the first being the flatworms, platyhelminthes, the phylum nematoda, which included the round worms, and then phylum annelida, which included the earthworm and the leeches, and sandworms, which are segmented worms. And we talked about how there's some change that happens as you go through the the worm phyla. So the important thing to note with the flatworms was that they were the first to have three germ layers. So they're the first to be triploblastic and have more complex tissues. The first to have true tissues and some actual systems starting to happen. The roundworms, the phylum nematoda, um, a lot of them were parasitic. Some interesting videos that you could watch about them, um, but they were the first to have a uh, body cavity, but it wasn't considered a true body cavity, so they're called false, false body cavities. So they are the only group of pseudocoelomates. So that was an important thing to note about them. Um, all of the ones past the flatworms have three germ layers, okay, so they're also triploblastic. But these are also the first group to have a complete digestive tract. So they have a mouth and an anus. So their food goes in one path, in one opening, and out the other. Okay, then we talked about the earthworms. They were the first to have segmentation in their body form. But it was kind of interesting, and you'll see it when we dissect them. Um, or have, maybe you already have, but uh, they're segmented on the inside as well as the outside. So they have walls of tissue that divide them into sections on the inside as well as the outside, which is interesting. Now, this video is going to focus on the other three groups of invertebrates. Um, so the phylum mollusca, phylum arthropoda, and phylum echinodermata. So, if we go to phylum mollusca, um, they are the soft-bodied animals, and we often call them mollusks in general. Uh, but they include um, they include gastropods. Gastro means stomach, so stomach-footed group, which are slugs and snails, and they move on. Um, they all have what what we refer to as a muscular foot for movement. So theirs is the stomach foot, so um, gastropod. Uh, some of them have shells, some of them don't. So most of this group have a protective shell. And another group are the bivalves. So bivalvia is their class. So they include the two-shelled ones. So clams and scallops and mussels, all of those. If you open them up, they have a soft body. They're protected by a shell. Um, these organisms are all bilateral in symmetry. They are triploblastic, meaning they have three germ layers and more complex organizations. They have true tissues and some systems. And they are coelomate. So coelomate meaning they have um, a true body cavity. So we talked about quickly about the gastropod family, or not family, but proper term would be class, the gastropod class, the bivalves, and we also have cephalopods, so head-footed. Cephalo means head. So they include octopus and squid. So one of our groups was looking at the squid, and the squid is kind of unique in that the squid has 
a, a remainder, a little piece of shell left inside of it called the pen. It's kind of funny that it's called a pen because they also have the ink gland, which they use for defense, and they, so, pen and ink, kind of, anyway, kind of funny that the, the terms are used that way. I'm pretty sure they did it on purpose, so. Um, so the squid had some unique features and just make sure you keep note of the ones that we talked about in the lab part. You should know that they have um, the special way of moving using jet propulsion. Um, they have arms and then they also have tentacles. So the octopus has eight arms and the squid has eight arms and two tentacles. Okay, for manipulating things. Their mouth is in under here and so they can put their prey, use their arms to put their prey right into their mouth. The octopus is really cool in that it can go to really small shape, it can fit into any space and we'll watch a couple of little videos showing that. that uh, they're pretty amazing and they're very very smart. So they've done a lot of testing with octopus and in like maze sort of situations and and um, hunting sort of situations and you can see really highly developed nervous system and thinking skills. Phylum Arthropoda. Arthro think arthritis. Um, arthritis is uh, inflammation and pain and swelling in the joints. So arthro means joint and poda means foot. We talked about pseudopods when we talked about amoeba. Um, they had false feet. So pod means foot. Arthropoda means jointed foot or jointed leggers. Okay, this is actually the most successful phylum. There's over one million species that have been identified and there's still very many that have not yet been identified. Okay, um, it includes insects so that is why, the main reason why this phylum is so successful. Okay, because of the insect group. They're very diverse, they can live pretty well anywhere. Some live at the bottom of the ocean, some float in the air. They're, they have many different features that allow them to be so successful and one of your objectives is to um, look at those different features and make sense of their success and diversity. So again, arthropod means jointed foot so they have, they're a group that have jointed appendages. Um, now that is an important feature of them but they're not the only group to have them. Okay, so if I asked you, tell me some unique features of these guys, it wouldn't be jointed appendages because if you look at ours, we have joints in our arms and our legs. So we also have jointed appendages. Okay, um, they have segmented bodies. Okay, so we saw segmentation in the earthworms, so an earlier group, but this group has segmented bodies, so do we. Okay, another feature that's not just for them, but it does give them specialization and um, greater abilities um, and specialized mouth parts. So these are some of the things that we'll talk about when we talk about how they are so successful. One thing they do have that is unique to them is their exoskeleton. Okay, we have an endoskeleton, meaning it's an, an internal skeleton, a skeleton, a support system that's inside, under our skin. These ones, these organisms, have an exoskeleton, which is a hard outer covering, and theirs is made of chitin, the same stuff that was in the walls of fungi. So, because it's a hard outer covering, when they want to grow, they have to shed that. They have to molt, in other words. So they shed their outer, outer covering, their exoskeleton, at different stages as they're growing. They have bilateral symmetry. Okay, so you can draw a line, cut them down through the line, and it's like mirror halves. 
They're triploblastic, so they have three germ layers, which makes sense because they have more complex systems, tissues and systems, and they're coelomates, so they have a true body cavity. Uh, they have internal fertilization, so that means they have to have a means of getting the sperm inside to where the eggs are. So they often have what's called an ovipositor. They include insects, spiders, so the insect class is class insecta. The spider class is um, class arachnida. Arachnida? Yeah. Um, you may have heard of people who have arachnophobia, so that means they have a fear of spiders, so arachnids are spiders, the fancy word for spiders. Um, shrimp, lobster, crabs, barnacles, all of those are included in the arthropods. Okay? So, the Class Insecta is insects, class Arachnida is spiders, and class Crustacea, those are the three of the most commonly talked about classes. Um, class Crustacea are the crustaceans, which include lobsters and, um, sorry, not scorpions, but lobsters and crabs and things like that. Hermit crabs, too. One of your objectives is to be able to tell between spiders and insects. So you should know some differences between spiders and insects. So class arach arachnida are the spiders and class insecta are the insects. So we'll look at a spider and a grasshopper for our representatives or examples. So if you look closely, spiders, well you can't see how they breathe, but spiders have book lungs that kind of look like the pages of a book for breathing, whereas insects have air sacs. And we may get a closer look when we take a look at the grasshopper later. If you count their legs, spiders have eight legs, whereas insects have six. Body segment wise, spiders have two, <coughs> Excuse me. whereas insects have three. So insects have a head region, they have an abdominal, they have a head region, a thoracic region, and an abdominal region. In the spiders, they have what's called a cephalothorax, which is a combined region of head and thorax. So cephalothorax and abdomen. Okay, so it's like you combined these two to make a, a head thorax region called cephalothorax. Two body segments versus three. Uh, spiders don't have any wings, whereas grasshoppers have two pairs of wings, like other insects. So they have wings. Uh, they have a different number of eyes, so spiders can have two, four, six, or eight simpler eyes, and insects have two compound eyes. Spiders don't have any antenna, whereas insects have two pairs of antenna. Um, in terms of stages of development, spiders tend to have two, whereas insects tend to undergo multiple stages, so they undergo metamorphosis, like a frog does. Some reasons why they are so successful. One is their exoskeleton, which provides like an armor to them. It's hard and it's waterproof and it's a great site for muscle attachment. So their exoskeleton is a major feature that gives them success. The fact that their body is divided into segments is important because it provides a point of attachment for jointed appendages that are specialized. So some of them are specialized for feeding, some of them are specialized for movement, type of movement, and some for reproduction. Okay, Their nervous system, they have a relatively large brain for their size, which allows them to coordinate body functions and they have advanced sensory organs for the type of organism they are. In terms of feeding, 
They have very diverse mouth and leg parts that are specialized depending on what they eat. So that way they can eat different types of things and not um, overlap as much in what they feed on. So they don't have to compete as much if they have their own unique food source, right? So they have mouth and leg parts that are specialized for different types of plant or prey, depending on what they tend to eat. So they're the most successful species on Earth. So insects, most successful class. Why? Okay, their small size allows them to live anywhere and hide easily. They have three pairs of legs which allow them to move quickly to get away from predators. Their wings allow them to find food and mates quickly and to avoid attack so they can get away faster or go up to a different level. Mimicry is something that they use um, in order to avoid being captured by their predators so they can blend into their surroundings. So there's some really neat ones. This is um, one insect that's blending in with the stick or branch. They have complex social systems. So for instance, they may have queen and soldiers and workers which have different roles and communication system that allows them to work together more effectively and they can protect each other too. Their life cycle, um, they start off dramatically different from their adult form, so that means that they will eat different things and have different habitats, so there's less competition between the different forms that they take. They transform quickly, and they allow many offspring to be produced quickly. Okay, and the process they go to is referred to as metamorphosis. So it's a series of many different, very different stages that they go through. So any of these little videos um, I will include on the website. These are just some examples of mimicry that you might see. Okay, so see if you can find them. Here is a butterfly. So you can see tiny little marks right here. This is the butterfly's wings. Okay, here's an insect here. There's the praying mantis. Okay. There's the insect there. So pretty cool. That is called mimicry. And... The last of the phyla that we're going to talk about for the invertebrates is phyla machinodermata. Now, derm refers to skin, and echino means spiny, so they are the spiny skinned animals. Um, they have radial symmetry. If you think of the examples within the group, then um, that's it, it's pretty easy to remember them because starfish belongs to this group. Okay, they're really called sea stars, um, but we us we've grown up calling them starfish. So, starfish, the sea urchin, the sand dollar. This is a sea cucumber. It also belongs to this group. Okay, so they have radial symmetry, they kind of radiate out from a central region. They are triploblastic. So again, they have a little more complex body form because they have three germ layers that can. Um, develop into different types of tissue. Coelomate, they have a true body cavity. They are deuterostomes like us. Okay, that means that's why they are put so high on the levels of phyla. They're right before our phyla because we have a similar embryonic development. Seems to me like the arthropods would be a lot more complex than a starfish, but they are group. This group is grouped closer to us because we're believed to have evolved from a, a closer ancestor. Okay, I think this was a graphic to show that. Okay, so we kind of came from a common ancestor because we have similar um, development in the embryo. So deuterostome simply means stone means mouth, deutero means secondary. That means that. 
for us, the first opening that forms is not the mouth. The first opening that forms is actually the anus. This is saying that the secondary one that forms is the mouth. So for all the other invertebrate phyla, they are protostomes, which means that the first opening that forms in them is their mouth. So we have our anus came first. Um, a unique feature that the starfish have, they have a water vascular system. So inside of them they have a series of water canals that end in things called tube feet. So the tube feet, these are tube feet. If you can imagine um, a, a bulb that you're trying to suck up medicine, if you're trying to suck up medicine from the container, um, that's kind of like how the tube feet work. So if you squish and then you stick it to something, it has suction. Okay, so they have like little suction cups at the end. And so they use those two feet for moving. So they can suck onto things and move along like rocks or crawl up the side of a wharf. Um, but they also use them to pry open their prey. Okay, so they'll keep on exerting pressure using that to open up, say, um, a scallop or a clam. Some cute little, well not, not necessarily cute, but little video clips showing them doing that. Um, oh yes, and there's a defense mechanism of sea cucumber that's kind of interesting. They will take these little tentacles that they have and they stick them out and pull them back in and stick them out and pull them back in to filter feed from the water. Hi Darlin. Oh, that's okay. You can just change them. Good morning. <laughs> I'll get you some clothes in a sec, honey. I'll be right there. I know. Beep. <coughs> so, um, sea cucumbers are kind of cool in the way that they feed, but at times when they are... Um, if there's a predator around um, or if they're agitated then they can basically throw up their insides and that can harm or distract their predator so it's kind of kind of neat thing about sea cucumbers so I'll share those videos using the website and a moto you can watch them at any time um, another interesting thing about um, organisms like sea stars or starfish is that they can undergo regeneration. So as long as they have, let me see if I can find a picture. Um, as long as they have a piece of what they call their central disc and a piece of their arm and arm, they can regenerate or grow back the rest. Um, So, this was the arm that was originally there with a piece of the central disc. The whole rest of the starfish can grow back. This one's missing one. So you can have really unique looking starfish out there. And, oh, let's see. So some of them can look pretty funny until they grow their parts back completely. Um, so this is what we mean by, oh, perhaps this isn't the best, this is the water vascular system, it's showing the tube feet, and the canals, so there's the ring canal, and these are the arm canals, and then these are the little tube feet that are sticking down, so the brown is showing the tube feet and the wa water vascular system. Oh, you did a great job getting your clothes on. Well done. <coughs> so, um, this is <laughs> this is showing what can happen, and 
one time there was there was a lot of starfish in this in I don't remember where it was but um, in order to try and get rid of them they put them through a giant sieve so if you can imagine taking the starfish and putting them through a big sieve then they cut them into all these pieces when they cut them into all the pieces that just simply made them multiply because each of the pieces as long as they had a piece of the central disc and arm they grew back into starfish so that was before they realized that starfish could regenerate which is kinda cool so that is it for the first eight phyla of invertebrates um, the next video will focus on our phylum, so the phylum chordata, and phylum chordata has two sub. I think I cut myself off. Has two subphyla of invertebrates, um, but they share other features in common with us in our early development. So um, we'll focus on mainly the subphylum vertebrata, but we will talk briefly about the invertebrate chordates. So. Again, if you have any questions, ask anytime. My little man needs me, so we'll see. Talk to you later.